Hello everyone, welcome back to the second episode of The Orange Affair. I'm John DeLaverere here with Keith Bremer and Mark Eckenrod. We've got a big hoops matchup this weekend, some basketball recap, and we'll even throw some NFL at you today. Got a nice lineup, so let's dig in. You're taking some bullets there broadside with some of the uh, Syracuse comments. How you hanging? They have no idea. They don't. It's inaccurate. Well, then you don't understand me, and you're making a judgment. You got a fan base that thinks I got something into them. Don't tell me how upset I am. I didn't look into your heart. I didn't look into my heart. Man. If you have a short time to prepare, it's Advantage Syracuse. Because they came to whose house? <laughs> the Orange Affair. So let's get things started. As we previewed last week, Boston University came to Syracuse this, this past Saturday. For a uh, basketball matchup, Syracuse versus the Terriers. So, uh, interesting game, I thought. Um, we had some key performers that were some unheralded guys from our team. So, just looking for what you guys thought on the game. What went right, what went wrong? Mark, you want to get started? Well, I think what went right is our defense. You know, we again struggled uh, at defending the three pointer, but uh, we stopped them. We had 18, they we forced 18 turnovers, and I think that was a big part of the game. But what uh, really impressed me was we had some blocks. Troop, who actually came in, had some blocks for us, and uh, we won the paint, uh, the battle in the paint. I would say for the most part, uh, their scoring per- pretty much was just one player in Hankerson uh, knocking down threes on us. So we still need to improve there. But on the inside game, uh, I thought we looked better than you know what we looked at against uh, Wisconsin earlier in the year. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. Um, So last week, two of the keys to the game that we mentioned for SU, one was forcing turnovers, and the other was holding BU to poor shooting. So first off, they did a great job winning the turnover battle. They committed nine turnovers and forced 18 turnovers. And in terms of threes, uh, wild game for that. BU made 16 of 41 threes for 39%. That's actually a great percentage considering they jacked up 41 of them. Um, and then 72 threes taken overall between both teams was really a surprise. And Hankerson, as you mentioned, 10 of 20 from three for 34 points on the day. Uh, that was be used one of their lone bright spots. And for SU, getting back on track, Gillen and Thompson, that was huge. They were dominant all night. It's great to see because they're two guys who have really seen their minutes cut recently. They were declining. They were struggling. So I think that's the biggest takeaway. And, uh, like, you know Andrew White's going to put in some buckets. You know he's going to score and keep scoring. But those two, Gillen and Thompson, really shined, and that was my favorite thing to see from that game. I, too, was really impressed with uh, how Gillen and Thompson played. But for me, the most important thing that I saw was just the fact that Tyler Lydon, for stretches throughout that game, finally looked like his old self. He struggled for a lot of the games that we've seen this season. And uh, they finally utilized him kind of at the top of the key. He was hitting some mid-range jumpers. Uh, he didn't have a great game, but I thought that he finally looked good for the first time in a while. Um, that was a really big plus for me. Um, the one downside I had with this game was that was the rotations. I mean, once again, we're seeing a whole different rotation employed by coach. And, like, it worked. Like, we got the win. Um, And the emergence of Thompson on both ends of the floor was, it went really well. But it's just concerning that, you know, we're this deep into the season and we still don't have a rotation worked out. Mm -hmm. Coleman barely saw the floor after (laughs) playing almost the entire game last year. I mean, Chukwu was back in the game after sitting for two straight games. We played Gillen and Howard together, which we haven't seen much of this season. Um, It's just, you know, we're deep in the season, and the fact that we don't have anything close to a rotation worked out yet is just really concerning for me. I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. I completely agree. Um, But at the same time, it's interesting because last year we had none of this at our disposal, so you couldn't really see whether Beheim would have done that had he had more guys to play last year. Uh, It reminds me of his comments made toward Roberson when he was in the doghouse last year, how he said, if he had anyone else to play, Roberson would have played a minute. Um, now he does. Now he has Thompson. Now he has Coleman. Uh, well, he had Coleman, but now he has Andrew White, Gillen, all the transfers and, and incoming freshmen. But, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that there's no more of a set rotation at this point. But I, I'm interested to see how that will play out once we hit ACC play because maybe um, – 
that will be more finalized. But yeah, what are your thoughts, Mark? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, I think it matters when we hit ACC play. Right now, I'm okay with mixing up the lineup because if we didn't, we might not have you know had the chance to see Thompson drop you know 20 points last game. You know, so I think right now is the time we should, especially against teams like BU, be mixing up the lineup to try and see. You know, I think it's important to you know try to know which players to play. Not just in general, but which players to play with uh, other players. You know, I thought at stretches there we had Frank and Gillen on the floor, which is something we didn't see. And I thought that I like that setup for um, once in a while. I thought it was effective. So I th uh, think that mixing up isn't bad right now, but it will be if, um, when we get the ACC play. So I'm hoping we have something set by then. But in a lot of it's situational too. Um, against the zone of BU. Beheim went Thompson, and a lot of that was because Thompson's the hot hand. But Coleman does not provide that jumper. He has an okay mid-range jumper, but Torian was really extending his range. And situations like that, you're going to see different game to game based on the opponent. But like you said, a lot of it is strictly rotational and experimenting at this point in the season. Yeah, I expect there to be more of a definite lineup for this Georgetown game. I think we'll see more consistency um, in the lineup. We won't see as many changes as we did in the BU game. I just have some questions. Like, is Roberson actually going to get benched for the entire season? If that's not the case, I don't see the point of benching him in these games. I mean, he's a guy, like, last season, we always go back to the Duke game. He played a very valuable role in that win. I just don't think he's the kind of player that we actually see sitting, sitting on the bench all season. I agree, and I don't think he should be. Um, I think with the scores on this team, Beheim said that if he plays that long and scores what one point or whatever, he shouldn't be. He won't be out there. Um, but his value on defense is astounding. His value on the boards is astounding, and I think especially if Coleman and um, Torian don't have big nights, then Roberson is needed. That's why I think he should be played at least more in these games, not necessarily the role he had last year, but at least give him about 15 minutes a game to to get his confidence back, and so he's readily available when those two guys are struggling. I mean, he played a decent amount, I think, even in the last game he came in. I think what we saw was he didn't start and he sat for a long time, but he played the last eight minutes of the first half, and he probably ended up playing you know, close to 14 to 15 minutes in the end. But, you know, I definitely think I he needs to be playing more minutes. But I think a lot large part of that was how hot Thompson was in the last game. So, you know, I don't know if that really tells his full tale of how long uh, Burberson's going to play or not. You know? And how hot Coleman was in the previous two games besides yeah. that. So that could play into it as well. Yeah. Right. Well, looking forward at our schedule, the rivalry is coming back this Saturday to the Dome. You know, we're taking on the good old Georgetown Hoyas. I think this is going to be a really good game. You know, the Dome's going to be packed. But, uh, Keith, what should we be looking forward to in this matchup? So Georgetown is an interesting team with a lot of guys who came in as big recruits but have seen their roles shift. They're a really top-heavy team. They have two big scores to, that look to take over the game. They're both upperclassmen guards. The senior, Rodney Pryor, and the junior, LJ Peak. They average 20 and 16 points per game. So I look for those two to take a lot of jumpers because of our long zone. It's really interesting to me to see how Georgetown's ball movement plays out, which I think is the key of the game for them. So throughout the years, we've seen Georgetown have a really agile group of guys. They've been known for their quick precision passing and just like tearing defenses apart. So, but they have these two scorers now, and it's a different team. So. It'll be interesting to see whether the plays are just drawn up strictly for them and we see some more iso ball um, rather than those quick passes we're used to seeing. But on the other end, for Syracuse, I think they need balanced scoring. So Georgetown tends to rely on those um, two guys. Syracuse, it depends game to game, as we've seen this season. But Georgetown really keys in on their opponents, big scorers. So Syracuse can't afford to play a game where it's just Andrew White or just Coleman or Tyus or whoever. They need a really balanced attack to wear the defense down, and if they can do that, I think they'll control the pace of the game, the momentum, and everything will swing in their direction. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, for Syracuse to succeed, I think we just need to get a hand in prior and peak space and get rebounds. You know, I think 
people are more likely, you know, to take our zone apart if they work inside out. And I don't know if Georgetown's going to uh, be able to do that with our size. And I think if we can just make them take jump shots, and then as long as we're rebounding, that's going to play into our favor. You know, we just played this team last year, but both our teams, Georgetown and Syracuse, have much different teams than we uh, were last year. So I don't think last year's game is really going to play into this year. But uh, I think rebounding, you know, it's always a key for us because we've struggled there. We saw what Wisconsin was able to do with us do against us. But at the same time, we saw Hankerson uh, hit all those threes against us last week. So we just have to make sure we're getting a hand in their face and uh, rebounding. And offensively, I agree, we need a more balanced attack. I think we need a more balanced attack all year. So I hopefully we're going to be able to get that done. And the thing with Georgetown, too, is a lot of their recent more dominant teams, they've had the one score yeah. complemented by a bunch of really good college fundamental players around them. Like when they had Otto Porter, the la I think that was the last Big East matchup we had. Uh, before that, it was Roy Hibbert in 06, 07. They, when they're dominant, they seem to have that one guy, but every year it's just, no matter whether they have the star or not, a lot of really fundamentally good college players um, surrounding that star. So it'll be interesting to see how they complement um, the, the two big scores for Georgetown. So right now Georgetown sits at 6-4. and four. Um, They've had a couple games against some pretty good teams. I know they had a one-point loss to Maryland. Who Maryland isn't overly strong, but you know they're they're a possible tournament team. Yeah. They played Wisconsin, they beat Oregon, and Oregon's a good team. Um, but I think this is a team that's gonna play us pretty tough. I think it's gonna be a close game. Um, like you guys have already said, um, Pryor and Peak are clearly their two guys combining for 37 points a game. Um, they're the only two guys on the team that average more than 22 minutes a game, so they're just really the focal point. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's going to come down to how effective the zone is in stopping these two guys. But I, mean, I hate to break on it again, but the rotation's big for me. Who are we going to see at the big guy positions? Are we going to see Thompson? Are we going to see Coleman? Are we going to see Chukwu? Um, um, is Gillen going to get an extended role after his great game last game? So that's an interesting note for me. Um, but beyond that, I just think this is a really big make or break game for us. It's been an up and down season so far. Um, everyone knows the rivalry that we have with Georgetown. I think that this can be a momentum shifter. You know, if we can pull off the win against Georgetown, maybe, you know, moving forward, this can be big for us, be a turning point in the season. I just think when all said and done at the end of this year, this is the game that we're going to look back on. And whether we win or lose, I think it's going to be, you know, the momentum really shifted in this game. That's a good point. Uh, it's definitely a make or break game for us sitting at six and three. If we drop to six and four, we legitimately don't have another non-conference game that with any relevance besides St. John's, and even that is a stretch. Um, mm -hmm. People could say even this is a stretch with Georgetown um, at the record they are. But yeah, I think that's uh, really important for us, and um, it's Pearl Day at the Dome, $31 tickets in honor of Pearl. They're trying to get 31,000 people there. It's going to be rocking, an old-school matchup, so I really look forward to uh, the game on Saturday. Yeah, no, I think we're two very comparable teams right now with where we're at. You know, they, we saw them get beat by Wisconsin. We've seen them play well. We've seen them play bad against bad teams as well. But like you said, this is our last uh, non-conference game that really holds any significance. So this is definitely going to be a bit telling uh, story for how Syracuse's season may play out in the end. I think that's also a good point, Keith, is, you know, it's Pearl Day. I think this is just going to be a crazy crowd in the Dome this Saturday. I'm yeah. disappointed I'm not going to be able to be there. I know you guys are both going to be there, but I think it's just going to be a crazy game. Fans are going to love it. I think, you know, if we can back our team, I think that maybe, you know, just home court advantage could be the difference uh, when all said and done in this game. Yeah, the uh, old school aspect is really cool for me in this game. I know the rivalry isn't what it used to be. It's not even close. It's not the Big East. These teams aren't the same top to bottom teams. But the crowd that's going to be there... The two head coaches, John Thompson and Beheim, with the history together and with going back from that, um, it's going to be a really cool atmosphere. And yeah, like you said, I, I look forward to going to the game and really watching this unfold. All right. So moving on from that, um, I know that we have. We're going to bring it back to you. Our uh, Keith's favorite section. My Guess favorite. that player. Guess that player. <laughs> So what do you have for us, Keith? 
So unfortunately, we only have one guess that player today. And this player leads all scholarship guards in field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and three-point percentage. All three categories. Clean sweep. I I would guess John Gillen. That would be my guess. Mark, who, guess Mark, who do you got? I'm going to go, yeah, I think it has to be Gillen. You guys are both right. John Gillen is leading the way in all categories. He's shooting 52.7% from the field, 75% um, from the free throw line. That's tied with Andrew White. Um, and then 48% from three. So yeah, Gillen, I was really impressed to see those numbers. Those are really um, impressive numbers. Yeah, all across the board. He's He doesn't put the ball up a lot, but he's efficient when he does. You know, Gillen's a guy that I would love to see get a little bit more extended run. I feel like he's a guy on offense that, you know, it takes him a while to kind of get in his groove, but like we saw against Boston University, when he gets hot, he can hit down some shots. He can be a big focal point for us on offense. I think that when he plays, he's not getting enough playing time in a row, kind of. And I think he could be a huge force for us on offense, well, given the opportunity. Like I was saying earlier, I think the big difference was we played him and Frank last game, so Gillen didn't have to play point guard. I think he got more looks off Frank being able to bring the ball up the floor and him getting set to shoot. And I think uh, that's something we may see a little more of in the future here. But, yeah, no, when Gillen's hot, obviously. He had five, five threes in a row. You know, he was five for five in that last game at one point, so definitely when he's hot, he's hot. And I think a lot of it is situational adjustments with the guards. So I think Andrew White does play the three, but he he's also with the two a lot. So I think with his incoming transfer, a lot of times Bayheim and the coaching staff kind of feel obliged to give him minutes and give him breaks that other guys, say Frank Howard, wouldn't get if they made the same play. We've seen that a lot um, with Bayheim's tenure. But... White is a scorer, so I feel like at times when the offense is stagnant, they are reluctant on taking him out. But once they get all three guards in there, if you figure Frank, Gillen, um, and then Andrew White, maybe even Tyus um, flipped with Frank, that's a really good lineup, and I think that's been effective in every game for Syracuse. Well, I think another just quick thing to note with Gillen is that this is a team on offense that we have some shooters and we don't really have anyone who's aggressive in taking it to the basket. I agree. And in the short amounts of time that we've seen Gillen on the floor with the ball in his hands, I think that he is not afraid to go to the hoop. He draws fouls, as we know from the stat. You know, he shoots well from the line. And I think that's something that we could use more of. I mean, I know last season, Benajay was our guy. Richardson was our guy. They would always take it to the hoop. And this season, you know, it's, I think that's why our offense gets stagnant. There's no one cutting. Um, there's no one who can then we can get a kick out three. We lived on the kick out three last season. Yeah. So I think Gillen's ability to get to the hoop could be valuable for us. I've seen a lot more of uh, lazy pick and rolls that end up with perimeter passing and jump shots than I'd like to. That's kind of what you would expect at this point in the season. Uh, last year we saw it a lot too, but as it gets going, that's a great point. I'd love to see Gillen drive to the basket. Frank, even with his big frame. Um, but if we can get guards to drive to the hoop, it allows for a opening up the whole offense, so that's, yeah, that's key going forward. Yeah, we're pretty much only playing outside the three-point line, and if we want to uh, succeed, we're going to have to become better inside the three-point line and scoring, and, you know, I think that's what we we're kind of relying on Leiden for, and we really haven't seen that yet, so hopefully he can get going, and actually his three-pointer hasn't really been on, you know, like we saw last year, so mm -hmm. uh, we definitely have to get better inside the three-point line, though, and you know, but that's why the offense, I think, gets stagnant. Yeah, Leiden has uh, shot 34.3% from three this season. And overall from the field, he shot 39.2% from the field. So Boston University's three-point percentage last game was equal to Leiden's field goal percentage for the season. Yeah, so, you know, that's telling right there. on each you know, one. Like this is struggle yeah. this year, you know. We were that's that's your go-to guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, moving on from men's hoops, uh, you know, Syracuse has had sports all over the place, you know, lots of news in football, some in soccer, so Mark, what do we have from non-basketball sports at Syracuse this week? Well, in recent news uh, for the men's soccer team, Chris Nako uh, has just been invited to the MLS uh, Player Combine. This is a great accolade and uh, accomplishment. He led Syracuse this year in uh, goals and points. He had seven goals with 15 points, so that's quite an accomplishment. He's had a great career here. 
Also, Ambed Atalo just added more accolades to his name as he was named third team All American honors in the Associated Press. You know, just hoping he would you know get second team, maybe even first team on a long shot. But we'll take third team for how the way our season turned out in the end. Also, uh, just uh, announced today, um, cornerback Devin Butler is transferring from Notre Dame to Syracuse uh, this year. And this could be big for Syracuse, uh, considering we just lost Winfield, who is still trying to decide where he's transferring. But on the other news, we also were losing running back Jordan Fredericks, who also decided to transfer. So Winfield and Fredericks are going to be leaving here. And Fredericks is a guy who went from being the prominent running back in Scott Schaefer's system um, to being the odd man out in Dinos. And for Devin Butler, if you're an Orange fan and you think you've heard the name Devin Butler before, that's because there's already a Devin Butler on the roster at wide receiver. So there'll be two guys on the team next year with the exact same name. Keith coming in with a solid back. <laughs> so in a week where Syracuse sports were kind of quiet because of finals week, there wasn't much going on. Uh, the women's basketball team, you know, they also had a relatively quiet week, but they did have a game this past Saturday where they took on Niagara and walked out with a 49-point, 109-60 to 60 victory. They really kind of just took them to town. Like I mentioned last week, it was just a matter of time before our girls kind of got their feet under them. Mm -hmm. Kind of bumpy stretch to begin the year, but in this past two weeks, you know, they've really come into their own. They've got, they've got a string of wins together, and it seems like they're coming together at the perfect time. They're rolling right now, and their next few games are part of the Florida Sunshine Classic Tournament. Um, and then right after that, they had directly an ACC play. So it's good to see them kind of come together right at the perfect time. Hopefully we see them keep this winning streak going and kind of just build on the momentum they have going right now. So moving into some hot topics, we usually bring you Syracuse sports, but this week we are diving into some NFL, you know, the good old National Football League. We're giving out some awards for what we think. So far, we're going to look at the MVP. Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, and then Comeback Player of the Year. And we all have some varying opinions on these, so let, let's see what we got. Hot toppers are coming. So for MVP, let's all go over our MVP picks. For me, it's Le'Veon Bell, and not just because he ran all over my Buffalo Bills last week. The numbers are really in his favor. So this according to 538.com, Bell is averaging 161.6 yards from Skimmer's from scrimmage per game this season, which is 20.8 more than David Johnson, 29.8 more than Ezekiel Elliott, and at least 50 yards more than everyone else in the league. Uh, remember, he missed the first three games of the year for the suspension, so in overall rushing, he's not leading, but in this category for um, yards from scrimmage, he is. So if he keeps up that pace, he's going to be second all time. In that category, only behind Priest Holmes in the 2002 season. Shout out the Kansas City Chiefs. Le'Veon is the is second in the league in rushing yards per game, six in yards per rush, and among all players, he's fourth in receptions per game with 6.7. So he does it all, um, and that's why his all-purpose yards are so high. Le'Veon Bell is my pick for MVP. So I looked at a few different guys here. Ultimately, you know, I looked at the guys in Dallas. Couldn't quite get my hand on them. I looked at a few different quarterbacks, and, you know, no one really stood out to me too much statistically. Matt Ryan's putting up the best stats, but I couldn't quite give it to him because of the Falcons have been too off and on this season. So my guy for MVP is Matthew Stafford, and it's not because Stafford has been the best quarterback in the NFL because he just hasn't been. Um, he's 10th in the NFL in QBR. He's 8th in passing yards. These are good numbers. They're not great numbers. But this guy can flat out play, and he's shown that he can be an elite NFL quarterback this season. In the past, I've been a critic of Stafford. You know, the past few years, I've been like, you know, this guy isn't what everyone thought he could be. I feel like he's really come into his own this year. He's led the Lions to the NFC North leading record of 9-4. and four. I don't think most people had the Lions winning that division coming into the year. Um, so I've just been impressed. It's a team with no rushing game. Their leading rusher is Theo Riddick, who gets 35 yards per game. They've had running backs in and out all season long. They added Forsett, cut Forsett. Dwayne Washington's been hurt. And it's an offense that just absolutely runs through Matthew Stafford. So I just think that with what the Lions have done, it's all been on the back of Stafford. 
this team will win with Stafford, this team will lose because of Stafford, <laughs> and I'm giving him the MVP. My uh, one thought on that, I really like the shout out to Stafford, especially losing Megatron to retirement before the season, and with, like you said, not much of a run game, I just don't see any way in any scenario that Matt Stafford wins MVP, but I like the shout out, he's been great for my fantasy team. <laughs> no, I, I mean... I looked at you know I looked at Le'Veon Bell just like you, but I felt like the three game suspension would keep him out. I looked at Tom Brady, and I think Tom Brady might deserve it, uh, but his four game suspension I think will keep him out. But when I look at MVP, I like to pick someone who changed the uh, entire culture of a team around, and so that's why I went with Derek Carr. Uh, he's a 96 passer rating right now. He's averaging 268 yards a game. He's 24 touchdowns. And I felt like a lot of people considered him a favorite before they went up to Casey and lost. It was a bad weather game. He did not play well. But I still think he, he's a very deserving candidate. And the reason I picked him is because he, he wins when it matters. You know, he has uh, seven game-winning drives in the fourth quarter uh, to take the lead, just like he did over your Ravens, Sean. But uh, I, uh, I think Derek Carr has really transformed this team around, and I think he has a shot at the MVP. You know, I love Derek Carr. I thought long and hard about him. I think ultimately the reason why I went against him was because four points just isn't going to cut it in fantasy, and he really let me down in the first week of the playoffs. Hard feelings, yes. You know, I am petty, and that's probably why I went against the guy. But uh, Derek Carr is having a fantastic season. Yeah, I, Derek Carr was my second pick for MVP. I just thought Val stood out um, in terms of his position group more. Um, but yeah, Carr has really changed the culture around Oakland, as has Jack Del Rio. So I like Derek Carr a lot, and he's a really good, fun to watch quarterback that will only develop more as he gets more experience within the league. All right, so moving on to our next award, we have the DPOY Defensive Player of the Year. A lot of deserving guys this year, I think. I know no one is kind of sold on anyone, but uh, Keith, who do you have? So my pick for Defensive Player of the Year from the University of Buffalo, Khalil Mack. He has 10 sacks, 13 QB hits, 5 forced fumbles, an interception, and a touchdown in the last 8 weeks. So he's been a shining star in this Raider defense. And this defense, overall, it's not great. So without him, they would just really struggle. Besides Khalil and Von Miller, I don't see anyone in the NFL who just takes over games um, in the fourth quarter like they do. Khalil Mack is my pick. Um, my alternate would be um, Vic Beasley of the Atlanta Falcons. He's had a great season. If I didn't go with Mac, my second pick would be Vic Beasley. So I'm going to double up here. I also cannot go against Cleo Mack. He's sick. I've always <laughs> loved this guy. I love this guy coming into the NFL. I loved him after his rookie season. I love the way he plays football. He's the kind of player that he's going to put up great numbers, but even in the games where he isn't putting up the stat, the sacks, the, the hits, He's the kind of guy that if you keep your eye on him for every down on defense, he does something positive on literally every play. Mm -hmm. And there's just not many guys in the NFL that can affect that side of the ball the way Mac does. And so he's just, the production's been unreal this season. Guys like that just aren't, they're, they're not out there in the NFL. And he's just a force for the Raiders. He's my pick. Who do you got, Mark? No, I agree with you guys. Cole Mac is one of the best players, but he's not who I chose. I've chosen my heart on this one maybe a little too much, but... I have to take Eric Berry as a dark horse to win, and the reason I chose him is that he's everywhere on the field, and he makes plays just like Khalil Mack does to change games. We saw that against the Falcons when he had the pick six and the interception on the two-point conversion that he took back to take the lead, so he's making plays to change the uh, game around, but except the debacle against the, Chief, uh, the Chiefs had against the Steelers, they've been one of the best in the league all year. And they've now accounted the uh, defense and special teams for 49% of the Chiefs' points, which is 7% higher than the 85 Bears and 3% higher than the 2,000 Ravens. And these are considered the best defenses, you know, all time. So with that uh, number being said, I think uh, Eric Berry. I'm a big uh, Eric Berry fan, and he's a free agent after this season, so a lot of teams are going to be breaking out their checks books to uh, <laughs> hand him over whatever he wants to join their team. I'm a big Eric Berry fan. I love Eric Berry too. He's the kind of guy that you're not going to find someone who's never rooting for this guy. Yeah. Everyone loves Eric Berry. And on that point of the Chiefs defense and special teams, 
Going to give a quick shout out to Tyreek Hill. He's been an absolutely monstrous returner for the Chiefs and my fantasy team. That's probably where a lot of those points are coming from. He's just he's so quick. He's fast. But uh, moving on, uh, Rookie of the Year um, is an interesting award race this season. You have uh, two two guys on the same team that are that are going for this award. But I'm interested to see that who you guys are choosing for here. So Mark, who do you got for Rookie of the Year? Yeah. It pretty much is the first time I've ever seen that two rookies of the year, you know, could would be on the same team. But uh, I really thought about it um, between Dak and Elliott, and I had to take uh, Ezekiel Elliott just because I think he makes a bigger difference for the Cowboys. You know, he's brought them to double-digit wins, which, you know, we've seen the Cowboys struggle and get 9-7 and seven every year. So um, I think Elliott has to win. I think he makes the biggest difference for that team. He's already a top you know, five running back in the league. So I'm going to go with Elliott. Yeah, I'm also going to go with Ezekiel Elliott. He's had an amazing season. <clears throat> no one could have predicted, especially after the first few weeks. He wasn't getting a ton of carries. Um, but, yeah, the numbers he put, he's putting up, he probably won't get to um, Eric Dickerson's rookie rushing record, of uh, just over 1,800 yards. But he's as dominant of a rookie running back as we've seen in a long time. I'm trying to remember um, who else, if you guys – anything pops into your head of a more dominant rookie running back in our era. But yeah, leading the league in rushing as a rookie, Ezekiel Elliott is a monster and will be for a long time. So I'm going to sweep the panel here, also choos choosing Ezekiel Elliott. I just can't see a case being made for anyone else. Dak's been great, but I still think the offensive horse for that team has been Elliott all season long. And it's exactly what he is. He is a horse. He takes carries. You know, he'll run right up the middle. He'll run to the outside. He catches passes. He's a great blocker. He's a, one of the best all-around running backs in the NFL. Um, and I just think it's interesting because so many critics gave Dallas a hard time because of that pick yeah. um, in the draft. Yeah. And yeah. looking back on that, no one would say a word right now because he has just been that good. And I know right. there's the offensive line that you have to give credit to, but yeah. um, he's great. He's great in all aspects of the game, so I'm also going Elliott here. And they, they really honed in at this draft on two stars, and a lot of it is chance, a lot of it's the team around it, um, but right now there's no better rookie quarterback than Dak Prescott, and there's no better rookie running back than Ezekiel Elliott, so even behind that big O-line, uh, Dallas has made some great selections in the draft. So moving on to our final award. We have Comeback Player of the Year. This is probably my favorite award because you can make a case for almost anyone. So, curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Keith, who do you got for Comeback Player of the Year? For Comeback Player of the Year, I have the Buffalo Bill, Lorenzo Alexander. I don't know how you could not say this guy's not in the conversation. Nine sacks and zero interceptions in his first nine NFL seasons combined. But in this one season, first season with the Bills, he has 10 sacks. He had his first pick uh, Sunday on Big Ben, and he's bounced around in his NFL career. He started as an O-lineman, went to D-line, is now a linebacker. He wasn't even supposed to start. Shaq Lawson had that injury before the season. He stepped in and has been the best player consistently on this Bills defense, and otherwise the defense has been really disappointing coming from a Bills fan. It's been hard to watch this year, but... Lorenzo Alexander has not been hard to watch. He's been wonderful, and uh, I hope we re-sign him next year. He's just a great player and a great guy. I love the story behind Lorenzo Alexander, but I went a different direction with this award. How can I not give it to DeMarco Murray? DeMarco Murray is a guy, you know, he set records in Dallas, um, bounced Dallas, went to Philly to head Chip Kelly's offense, was a complete disaster. This past offseason, traded to the Titans, and this guy has been unreal. He has nine touchdowns, averaging more than 20 carries per game. He's been huge for the Titans, who have finally looked good behind Mariota and um, Murray. And, you know, all season long, I think that the reason why this Titans offense has been so good is because the improvement from Murray to what they had last season is just so great, and it's allowed Mariota to develop as a passer with a run game to kind of balance that out. Um, Murray's my pick. He's he's kind of cemented himself as a top five running back once again. So, uh, Mark, Mark, who do you got? I like both those picks. DeMarco Murray was my second pick, but I'm going to have to go with Le'Veon Bell. This is a guy, you know, he 
got injured last year. You know, he's coming off suspension, then he gets injured. He's dealt with injuries um, his entire career, which is scary because the Steelers play the Bengals on uh, Sunday, who have caused every single one of his injuries. But I think with the numbers he's putting up, you know, it's a lot like, you know, last year with uh, Steph Curry. He was the MVP and third and the most uh, improved player. I just think that's the kind of year Le'Veon's having. Um, he's breaking records out there. Ranford uh, had 298 total yards last week, so I'm going to go Le'Veon Bell. You just had to get his name in, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> no, I like the, I like the pick. It, his numbers have shot up this year, so yeah, I, that's a good pick. <laughs> As a Ravens fan, I hate saying anything positive about the Steelers. And I love you guys coming in with your homer picks for comeback player of the year, you know, Bills and Steelers. But usually I'd go against giving a guy like Le'Veon Bell the comeback player of the year because he's just been so dominant in his entire career. But if you actually take a look at his numbers this season, they're just unreal. I know you, you mentioned them earlier in the, in the podcast, Keith, but he's just so much better than what everyone else has done in terms of yards from scrimmage this game uh, in, in, in the season. So... Uh, Bell, I like the pick. I don't think they'll actually give it to him, but I like the shout out. He's been absolutely unreal this season. Yeah. So uh, before we get to next week's schedule, I want to go around and get all three of our opinions. Player of the game versus Georgetown for Syracuse. Who's it going to be on Saturday? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. I'm going to go with, uh, not a shocker here, but I'm going to go with Andrew White. He's had a few May games the past few games. You know, he hasn't been leading us in scoring. He's had a few downers uh, shooting-wise. I think maybe this is a game where he kind of comes back, um, fills up the scoring sheet, hits a couple threes, uh, leads us in scoring. So I'll go with White. I know it's not really a fun pick, but that's who I'll go with. I'm going to go with Tyler Lydon. Yep, I said it. Tyler Lydon will be the player of the game. Um, we see him come alive when the spotlight is on, whether it was in the battle for Atlantis last year when he had Jay Billis all over him, uh, loving everything he did. He played amazing in those games. And then in the NCAA tournament, of course, with his, uh, like, what, 20-something blocks over the course of the tournament. He loves it when the lights are on, and he had a sort of back-together game against BU. We, we could call it sort that. Sort of back-together. We could call it that. Um, He's on the right path, and I think this is the game where he finally gets off the schneid and finally uh, puts some buckets in and has a good overall game. I'm going to go out on even more of a limb here. I don't know if he's going to have the best numbers, but I think he's going to be the difference in the game in the end, and I'm going to pick Tyler Wilson. I knew he was going there. I knew I he was going Robertson's there. I think going to come in and make a difference, and enough of a difference that he's going to affect the game enough for uh, Syracuse to try to pull this one out. So it's that homer, it's that irrational love of Roberson, Mark. I'm, I'm picking, I'm picking Roberson. It's All right, gonna Keith. be his game. What do we have on tap for next week for Syracuse sports? So next week's a fairly slow week. Um, the only two sports in action are actually men's basketball and women's basketball. The men, of course, play Saturday home versus Georgetown. That's a new tip on ESPN in Pearl Day. Should be a really exciting game. No one plays on Sunday the 18th. Um, then the men are back at it. Monday, um, the 19th, they take on Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan's coach is former SU assistant Rob Murphy, so that should be a, a good showdown in his homecoming. That's going to be a 7 p.m. tip on ESPNU. The next day, uh, women's basketball versus Old Dominion. That's in the um, Florida tournament you were mentioning at Winter Park, Florida. That's a 3 p.m. start time. And then Wednesday, both teams are in action. The men taking on St. John's in that final decent non-conference um, opponent of the season. That's going to be 7 p.m. tip-off, televised regionally. And the women's basketball team uh, against the high-profile Texas A&M team in that Florida tournament. And that's also a 3 3.15 p.m. tip, just like the, the Tuesday game. So that's the schedule we have on tap for this week. All right, so that's everything we have for you guys this week. Thanks for listening. As always, I'm John DeLaber here with Mark Eckenrod and Keith Bremer. Going on a short hiatus because of winter break, but we will bring the Orange Affair back to you as soon as possible. Tune in next time. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. You know, we're on SoundCloud. We're on YouTube. Give us a shout, um, and we'll see you guys next time.